Good to be here. I uh, had a grand time, as I said earlier, putting on my John Denver Take Me Home Country Roads tape as I was driving over and enjoying the beautiful scenery of West Virginia and uh, getting a chance to see an old friend of mine also that happens to be in the area and uh, getting a chance to see John after all these years. It's been delightful. I appreciate his ministry. I appreciate his faithfulness in ministering as he does. And I've already enjoyed many encounters that I've had with a number of you this morning. So thank you very much for inviting me here. It's really a great honor to be speaking before you. I'd like to talk about Jesus and marriage. So uh, whoever's running the slides, if it might be possible to put it up also here. Uh, I can see the screens as well as, okay, you see it back there, good. Um, we have our text here from Mark 10. And when Jesus approached, they were asking him if it was permissible for a man to divorce his wife. And they did so in order to test him. In response, he said to them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed to write a certificate of divorce and to divorce. But Jesus said to them, with a view to your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this command. But... From the beginning of creation, male and female, he made them. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman or wife, and the two will become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What then God has yoked together, let no man separate. And again, in the house, the disciples were asking him about this. And he says to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she, after divorcing her husband, marries another, she commits adultery. Now, I'm gonna ask you to advance the slide, if you could, to slide 18. You can just actually plug in the number 18 in here, hit enter. Hopefully it will take us there. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with a view to desiring her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye threatens to be your downfall, take it out and throw it away from you. For, next slide. It is advantageous for you that one of your members be lost and that your whole body not be thrown into hell. And if your right hand threatens to be your downfall, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is advantageous for you that one of your members be lost and not your whole body go off into hell. Okay, we'll stop. And it was said, okay, that's good, right? And whoever divorces his wife should give to her a certificate of divorce. This is all from Matthew 5. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for a matter of sexual immorality, causes her to be led into adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, these are some hard sayings by Jesus, right? Uh, these are sayings that tell us something about what was important to Jesus. We all know well the stories about Jesus reaching out to the tax collectors and sinners, especially sexual sinners, and we know a number of individual stories about those. His reaching out to Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Uh, his reaching out to the sinful woman that's mentioned in Luke 7, the woman at the well at John 4, and others. And we love those stories because those are stories that tell us that Jesus also reaches out to us. And we rightly recognize that in our own lives, we're not perfect. We're not always thinking the thoughts that we should be thinking. We're often thinking thoughts that we shouldn't be thinking. We sometimes are tempted to do things that we shouldn't be doing, and sometimes we even do them. And so it's important for us to have an image of Jesus as somebody who reaches out even in our weakness and ministers to us and forgives us. 
But it's also important, on the other hand, to see this other side of Jesus, not as if Jesus is schizophrenic, it's wedded together into one view of things, and that is Jesus is also a figure who intensifies God's demand for our life. In other words, where we might want to think, since Jesus reaches out aggressively in love to those who violate God's demand, that therefore Jesus lowers that demand so that he can love us more easily. It actually is the reverse. Jesus actually reaches out to us in spite of the fact that he has a higher demand than anything we've even witnessed in the Old Testament. And this is certainly true with regard to sexual ethics, how we are to live our life in relationships with others in marriage, in dating. Jesus' expectation, as we've just seen, is not making it easier for us. It actually is a greater demand than anything that existed prior to this time. What Jesus essentially does is he takes some remaining loopholes that exists in the law of Moses, and he closes them. It incidentally says something extraordinary about the power and the authority of Jesus. He believed that he could unilaterally, by himself, amend the Constitution of Israel. That is the law of Moses, the law given by God to Moses at Sinai. He did not have to appeal to any other authority He simply said, I say to you the following. He'd usually preface it by amen, amen, which you usually have translated as truly, truly. Amen, as you know, is usually a response to something that somebody says, a confirming response. Jesus somewhat uniquely actually introduced his sayings with amen in order to say, in effect, I don't need anybody's confirmation. My word is is self-authenticating, it's its own confirmation. I'm not waiting for anyone else to approve it. I tell you this. And with regard to sexual ethics, Jesus looks at what the Old Testament gives, and already the Old Testament demand with regard to sexual ethics is pretty strong. That is, Jews in the ancient world looked at themselves in relation to Gentiles, and they said, we are moral when it comes to issues of sexual purity. Gentiles are not. Gentiles are engaged in a whole host of things rampantly that they should not be engaged in. Everything from same-sex intercourse to, to bestiality, to incest, to adultery, to prostitution, which was very widespread in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world, to fornication, and on and on. This is what characterizes Gentiles. Every Jew understood this, and it's why Paul, when he dealt with issues of sexual purity and morality uh, in his letters, always put them front and center, only second to idolatry concerns, because he knew Gentiles to be of this sort. But the Old Testament had a pretty strong view of sexual ethics and sexual purity in marriage and otherwise, and so there wasn't a whole lot for Jesus to say about it except to close a couple of remaining loopholes. Two chief loopholes that he closed in the Law of Moses. One was the Law of Moses didn't say anything about what you thought. So Jesus decided to bring the Law of Moses into one's interior life. What are you thinking about? Jesus said, if if you're a man and you look at another woman with lust in your heart, to want to possess her, to desire her, to to have her as your own. And it's not the woman you're married to. Then you have committed adultery in your heart. You don't actually have to outwardly live out those impulses. In your own heart, Jesus said, God wants to have the same control over your outer life as well in your inner life. And we're not going to give you a pass or exemption to that. Now, I know especially men, it's more difficult for women, men, women, I will tell you. Uh, there have act- there's actually been a federally funded study, uh, 20, 15, 20,000 people in the study, first world, third world, around the world, 
and they came to the astounding conclusion that men find monogamy more difficult than women. To which I say, what would we do without experts? These are your tax dollars working hard for you. They should have just called me in my office. I would have told them the answer to that question. They could have saved themselves the time and the money. Uh, and yet, Jesus did not give men a pass in their interior life. They, too, must also conform to God's demands and expectations. And what that means is not that you're never going to have desires that you shouldn't be having, but rather when you experience those desires and you become conscious of them, God actually wants you not to give in to them, not to entertain them, certainly in your thought life or in your behavior, and if you do, to repent of that. And never to tire of doing that because God is always gracious to receive that repentance and to welcome you with full arms like the father with the prodigal son or lost son. The other area in which Jesus closed a remaining loophole had to do with the number of partners in a marital bond. As you know, in the Old Testament, men were allowed multiple wives. Women, well, that we call that, we, we refer to it generically as polygamy. Technically, it's, uh, uh, there's a, if to have multiple husbands would be polyandry, right? To have multiple husbands. And to have multiple wives would be polygyny, from gune, meaning woman or wife. Women were never allowed multiple husbands. There was no polyandry in ancient Israel. But men were allowed multiple wives, polygyny, as the specific form of polygamy. What Jesus essentially did is he leapfrogged over that issue and went to an even harder issue. That is a revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause. And he closed a loophole in that. And on what basis did he close that loophole? He did it on the basis of Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. Genesis 1.27, God made us male and female. Genesis 2.24, for this reason, a man will become joined to a woman, and the two will become one flesh. What's the one thing in common with those two sets of verses? Only one point, that it takes a man and a woman, a male and a female, in order to be in a mar true marital bond. And on that basis, since it takes the two sexes or genders that exist, Jesus extrapolated a principle about the number of partners in a sexual union, limiting the number to two, whether at any one time, therefore no polygamy, or a serial form of polygamy in effect, this revolving door of divorce and remarriage. Jesus said, how many, in effect, look at how many sexes God designed for sexual union. Two, male and female, man and woman. That, he said, should tell you something about the number of partners God wants to limit a marital bond to. Two. Once a man and woman are brought together, they bring together the totality of the sexual spectrum, meaning that a third party is neither necessary nor desirable. What Jesus said was, that person that you are married to, whether or not you know it, whether or not you agree to it, that is for life. Marriage is indissoluble. It's permanent. And Jesus said, you may dissolve it with a certificate of divorce, as Moses allowed you to in Deuteronomy 24. But as far as I am concerned, the marriage is intact, Jesus said. And if you give a certificate of divorce and then remarry, he said, you are committing adultery. And that's a hard saying. It's so hard that the disciples then concluded it's expedient then not to be married. Because if you can't get rid of a difficult spouse and you have to live with that difficult spouse for life, 
better to endure the hardships of singleness. Now, when they said that, you always have to love the disciples because frequently they just said what's at the top of their head, which is often what we think, but we don't want to express directly to look bad. But I'm thankful for that because those are the thoughts that I would have. That is a hard demand to be made. But Jesus understands as the purpose of marriage not to be able to get your gratifications met in life. Yes, marriage can have that salutary function. But the primary purpose of marriage, Jesus said, is to make two into one. And that purpose transcends any particular desires or wants that you may have. When those desires or wants conflict with that purpose. Now, you know what the second greatest commandment is, right? According to Jesus, second greatest commandment is Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? Marriage is a great example, a great venue for learning what loving your neighbor as yourself means. Because marriage is precisely about making two into one. And you're to regard the person you're married to as one with you. Ephesians talks about that in Ephesians 5. When it talks about husbands needing to love their wives, it says, no man ever hated his own body. The whole point of that observation is, you're now one body with her, one flesh with your wife. Therefore, what you do to her, you do to yourself. If you attempt in any way retribution against your spouse for anything your spouse has done, and by the way, I happen to know since I'm married and have the experience of a married person, been married since 1984, first met my, actually I first met my wife-to-be when I was 13, met her in junior high, my parents moved from Lowell, Massachusetts to Merrimack, New Hampshire, her parents had moved from Jamaica to Merrimack, New Hampshire when she was six, and when I got there when I was 13, saw her in my English class, first time I ever saw her, made a mental note of her. That's a person I want to date. Okay? Took many years, went to the end in high school, senior year in high school at the very end, I practically had to win every award and every state award, award imaginable in order to finally get her to date me. I had really had nothing clever, I just practiced the slow drip method. Keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Not creative, but eventually it gets the job done. And we started dating. Our first date was actually she invited me to church. I really didn't have any Christian faith at that time. As far as I was concerned, the last name of Joseph and Mary was Christ. Joseph and Mary Christ had Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that the way it works? I really had no awareness of this Christian faith business. And uh, over time, God used my ignoble motives to want to date her to actually get me to read scripture, to impress her that I was a Christian, even though I wasn't which is why I have to join the National Rifle Association when my daughters become dating age, uh, just to send the fear of God into them, But because uh, I know what men are like. But despite my ignoble motives, reading scripture to impress her, I was a Christian, even though I wasn't, I eventually became one, because Jesus, meeting, encountering Jesus in the word, made that kind of uh, impact in my life. And so I, we've known each other for a long time. We have a lot of history. When really not the right birth order, psychologists would tell you, our family dynamics in the background, we should never have been married, given those family dynamics. Uh, her mother was the, the, the strong person in her household, not her father. My father was the dominant person in my household. She was the oldest. Uh, she had a younger brother, dominated him. I had mostly younger sisters, dominated them. So put us together, doesn't work well. Okay, constant effort to dominate the other. Who's in charge? Who's in control? Right? So we don't have the sort of Ozzy and Harriet marriage that, you know, I see others have. Once a colleague of mine came into my office and he, he looked depressed and, and I said, uh, what's the matter? And he said, oh, I had, my wife and I had such an argument yesterday and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, come on in, we'll talk about it. And he came in, I'll never forget, his first words to me were, last night, Rob, it got so bad that, that my wife, he choked up as he was saying this. My wife almost yelled at me. And in my best pastoral tone, I said, get out! 
you just had my good day. Well, what's going on here? I couldn't believe this is what he's complaining about. His wife almost yelled at him. And then I was depressed for the next two months. So um, we're all in different circumstances, but what we learn in whatever our circumstance is, and some of us have greater mansions in the kingdom of God to come, because we already have a, we don't have everything we want now here. Others of us getting all here now in the present time, but either way, we are learning to become one in the marital bond. I had a, a close friend of mine, uh, sort of were three musketeers of us when I was in college. Um, I was the first to get married, then another friend of mine got married, and then the other friend, these other two were in my wedding party when we got married in 1984. And this third one, when he got married, he asked me to do a wedding charge for him. And I sort of came up with a fairly standard wedding charge. And then as I was sitting there, before the time came for me to give it, I realized I can't give that. That's not really going to be very helpful in this circumstance. I knew something special about my friend. And that is, my friend wasn't a very combative person, but rather somebody who shut down when conflict occurred and withdrew emotionally from whatever relationship that was. He got that from his father. It's pretty much the way his father treated his children, just completely emotionally disengaged. And so this is the practice that he learned. And so I gave a charge instead, which was also, in effect, to a charge to myself, which is that, you know what, there are, of course, going to be conflicts, not whether there's going to be conflict in your marriage. There will be. And when there is, how do we, what do we think about that? Should we shut down and become emotionally detached because that's happening? Entirely wrong approach. We don't bail out because there's conflict in the marriage. On the contrary, what I've tended to discover in my life is moments of difficulty and deprivation in life are actually moments of intense spiritual growth. Because when we're not getting what we want, we're forced either to continue to rely on ourselves and experience the distress that we're experiencing, or we learn to rely on the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 1, for example, that he was brought to a point of despair, near death, because of whatever circumstances he was facing in Ephesus. And yet, he said, God brought him to that point that he might learn not to rely on himself, but on the one who raises from the dead. And that's what difficult moments in life do for us. And marriage is no different. Marriage can become an occasion where the great, we may face the greatest challenges and the greatest difficulties of our life because we, we tend to give our spouse less slack, don't we? Because our spouse should know better. But that's the problem. Our spouse knows all the nuclear buttons to push at whatever moment they need to be pushed. And so... Sometimes the hostility in a marital bond can be even more intense than with any outsider because the wounds and the hurts can be deeper. And when that happens and there isn't forgiveness, then it often leads to the dissolution of the union. But only in our own minds, Jesus says. As far as God is concerned, the union remains intact. Jesus actually took the hardest cases of all. He talked about a woman invalidly divorced. That is, for example, a woman not divorced on the grounds of adultery. And he said, if that woman remarries, she commits adultery. And if a man marries that divorced woman, he commits adultery. Now that statement can only hold true if in fact the first union is still intact in God's eyes. You can only commit adultery if you're married to somebody else. So what Jesus is saying is that union in God's eyes still remains intact. You can issue all the certificates of divorce you want to issue. God regards it as intact. Now that's the hardest possible case. That'd be very hard for most pastors to actually hold up to with regard to whom they marry and whom they don't. But that is what Jesus says. 
and don't shoot the messenger. I have to deal with those texts too. And what it tells me that no matter how hard my marital relationship is. Now, why, now ask yourself why most people get divorced. Most people get divorced because they see a greener pasture outside their current marital bond. But if you realize that the only real prospect for you as a Christian, if you divorce your wife, is to, re is to remain celibate for the rest of your life, I can guarantee you the divorce rate in Christian circles would drop dramatically if that were preached in the pulpits. People would learn to put up with a whole lot if they knew the alternative was celibacy for the remainder of their life. When we are in conflict with another, especially in marriage, we then do have to rely on God for our sense of self-worth, importance, and significance. We have to rely on the fact that this trial, while it seems difficult, is nothing in comparison to knowing Jesus. That knowing Jesus is so great and so wonderful. I mean, just think about it. If you were to, if you, let's say you had a problem in your marriage today and uh, somebody, I came up to you and said, look, I've just won the lottery. Do you have a lottery in West Virginia? Don't play it if you do, but I'm just using an analogy here. I've got $6 million I'm going to distribute to you. All you have to do is stay married for the rest of your life to that person. I think they'll probably accomplish that. Because, wow, I got something else that makes me happy. Now, in the end, that won't actually do the trick because money is not going to satisfy beyond a certain point because it's superficial in terms of meeting needs. But we've won something better than the state lottery. Something not by human chance, but by divine design. God has redeemed us for a relationship with himself, which is extraordinary. And God daily wants to get to know us. God daily wants us to do what Jesus talked about in Mark 8. You want to know what discipleship Jesus said? You have to take up your cross, deny yourself, lose your life, and come follow me. That's the nature of discipleship. Does that sound like you get to do what you want to do when you want to do it, with whom you want to do it with? Doesn't sound like that to me at all. It sounds like a major demand in my life. I have to lose my life so that I no longer live my, for myself, but for the one who gave his very life for me that I might live. Because knowing Jesus is more important than gratifying whatever innate desires you have. And in the midst of that union between a husband and wife, we learn that reality. We learn it in the good times and we learn it in the bad times. In the bad times we learn, how can I love somebody who doesn't appear to be loving me in the way that I demand with whatever love language I have? Because God calls us to love, as Jesus talked about, to love even your enemy, and if your enemy, how much more your spouse, no matter what your spouse may or may not be doing to you. That's the little laboratory where we learn best how to love our neighbor as ourselves and how two may become one. Now, parenthetically, one other point this says about a raging debate in society today to whether or not we should grant gay marriage marriage between two persons of the same sex. Quite clear what Jesus' viewpoint on that was. There was none of that activity, no same-sex relationships of that sort going on in Judaism at the time. Nobody was even advocating it, much less doing it, because the Old Testament standard on this was clear. And it was set from Genesis on through the pages of Scripture. Every text, every narrative, proverb, poetry, metaphor, Every, every, uh, every piece of literature in the Old Testament always presupposes a male and a female in the union, without exception. Jesus, as we noted, determined a limitation on the number of partners in a sexual union to two on the basis of the two-ness of the sexes, male and female. 
the prerequisite for rejecting polygamy or revolving door of divorce and remarriage without cause is that God has created two and only two for pairing, male and female. That prerequisite is directly assaulted by having two persons of the same sex marry. It says there is no prerequisite of that sort, which also incidentally eliminates any creation-based, logic-based, or nature-based argument for limiting the number of persons in a sexual union to two. It's the two-ness of the sexes brought together, completing the sexual spectrum, that establishes the limitation of two persons to a sexual bond. Homosexual unions are a direct attack on that requirement. The foundation, Jesus said, for sexual ethics is male and female. He made them. A man is a counterpart to a woman, and a woman a man, not a person of the same sex. So we know then clearly what Jesus' view on the issue was. Lastly, what do we know about Jesus from his outreach to others? It's entirely consistent with Jesus' heightened demand in terms of sexual purity. Jesus aggressively reached out to the biggest violators of the very ethical standards that he was proclaiming, not because what they were doing wasn't terribly problematic for them, but rather because it could get them excluded from the very kingdom of God that Jesus was proclaiming. So you spend extra effort to reach out to those who might not be redeemed, those who might not experience a relationship with God for eternity. He reached out to tax collectors. By the way, I'm, I'm still working on my taxes. I hate doing them. Last moment, here I am. Okay, as soon as I get back home today, I got to wrap it up. But tax collecting is different in the ancient world. Tax collecting involves people who are complicitous with an oppressive foreign power, who have a justly deserved reputation for collecting several times more than they're supposed to collect, from fellow Israelites who are living on the economic margins of life and will likely starve because of you just over-collected from them. Liberation theologians would have a field day with them, and yet Jesus reached out aggressively in love to them. He didn't lower his standards. Jesus didn't say economic exploitation of others is okay. On the contrary, he ratcheted up God's demand with regard to material possessions. And yet, he aggressively reached out into the biggest violators of that demand, the tax collectors. Same thing with sexual sinners. We know that Jesus didn't soften God's ethical demand with regard to sexual purity. He intensified it. And yet, he reached out to sexual sinners because they were at the greatest risk of being excluded from that kingdom that he proclaimed. So what did Jesus say? If you sin seven times a day, at the end of the day you say, I repent, you're to be forgiven. I don't know about you, but if my spouse committed adultery seven times in a day and at the end of the day said, don't worry, honey, I repent, we're going to have a conversation. Because I'm not sure I can trust the genuineness of that confession of repentance after so many multiple offenses. But Jesus said, so generous is the graciousness of the church that we're to accept as genuine any confession of repentance, no matter after how many infractions have taken place. That's how gracious the church is. But for the sake of the person repenting, they must repent in order that they can be reclaimed by the kingdom. You know that saying about love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus 18, 1918? The context for that, it took me many years to figure this out. It turns out the context for Leviticus 19.18b, it's the second half of the verse, is Leviticus 19.17 and 18a. How about that? And here's what those texts say. You shall not hate your neighbor. You shall not hold a grudge against your neighbor. Uh, you not, shall not take revenge against your neighbor. And if your neighbor does wrong, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you incur guilt for failing to warn them. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. See that? If you don't warn your neighbor when your neighbor is engaged in sin that can injure their relationship with God, you don't love your neighbor. You don't take revenge against them. You don't hate them. It's not about you. It's about reclaiming the person whose relationship with God is being damaged by their behavior. And I want to close on this story. 
the story of the prodigal son, or lost son. You know the story well. A son receives his share of the inheritance from his father and wastes it on a dissolute lifestyle. His brother, even older brother even notes later that he squandered some of it on prostitutes. At a certain point in time, what happens to him? He runs out of money. And running out of money is a great, great way for getting your attention in terms of your relationship and your priorities in life. When he runs out of money, he starts thinking as he's eating with the pigs in the pig slop about his life and the way that he has been living it. And he comes to the conclusion that it will be enough if my father simply receives me as a hired hand and no longer even treats me as a son because I do not deserve to be treated as a son. And then he returns to his father. Now that's a metaphor for something. That's a metaphor for repentance. In fact, Hebrew word for return, shuv, is used for repentance. And the fact that he says, I'm no longer worthy to be even called a son is indicative of his repentance. He's not coming back for the other half of the inheritance. He's realizing that what he did was wrong and he'll take whatever his father has left for him. So he returns. And as you know, his father is just overjoyed and talks about slaying the fatted calf and having a celebration for him. No pound of flesh to be taken out of him. Why? Because his father was interested in only one thing. This son of mine that was lost has now been found. And finding in the deepest sense that he had been lost in relation to the Father, which of course is a metaphor for the relation to God and God's kingdom, and now has been recovered through his repentance. Now the older brother looked at that and said, wait a minute, I've been serving you all this time faithfully, and I haven't received this kind of celebration. There should be some sort of restitution that's made here because he squandered half of the inheritance. What are you going to do about that? And the father has to tell the older brother he's missing the point. The point is not the money. The point is the recovery of the lost son. Now, when I read that parable shortly after becoming a Christian, when I was 18 years old, first time I read that parable, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because literally and figuratively, I was the older brother. I had younger sisters. In fact, my mother had five children in five years, for which, she, for which alone she says she should go to heaven. Having had two, I'm half willing to concede the point. And five in five years, think about that. And then we're in elementary school, we get from first to fifth grade. Youngest of that set, imagine the pressure on her. All of us did extraordinarily well in school. All her parents, oh, my parents expected, all the teachers expected, she would follow suit, all this pressure on her. It was very hard for her going through the school systems as the fifth of the Gagnon children all through. So when she got to high school, she rebelled. And she got involved with the wrong crowd. She got involved with substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, smoking. She was regularly swearing at my parents in the house. It was constant tension, constant disruption of the household. We had never experienced anything like that. Then one day she ran away. And I'm sorry to say that my initial reaction, I wasn't a Christian at the time, my initial reaction was, good riddance. Now we'll have peace. I know that sounds harsh, but there had been so much turmoil for so long, and my parents were so distressed. But after she ran away, I would wake up in the morning, every day, to hear my parents wailing before I went to school. And I had to hear that for two months straight. I thought they were going to crack up. And the hate that welled up in my heart towards my sister was beyond imagination. 
She was found two months later by the police, many states south of where we lived. She didn't come out of her own accord. She was brought back by the police. And when she was brought back, I wanted nothing to do with her. As far as I was concerned, she was dead. Dead to me, dead to the family. Well, I became a Christian a few months after that. When I read this parable, the parable of the lost son, I knew immediately who I was in that story. Not the lost son. Pat yourself on the back if you think you're the lost son because you get to spend half your father's inheritance and then you get a celebration. Wonderful. No, I was the older brother. I was the one who had done what I should be doing. Here they were welcoming my sister back like nothing had happened, treating her as nicely as they could possibly treat her. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? And I read this parable, and I think, I'm worthy of Jesus up to a point, but now I don't see, I can't get to that point, that last point, the, where the older brother is a negative character in the parable. It took me a long time to wrestle through that text and realize the extent of grace that had already been ministered by God into my life. And that I wasn't really that different from my sister. In God's eyes, really no different in terms of the extent of sin. Now, my sister grew up later to be a wonderful parent and the sternest disciplinarian among all of us. Because, you know, she knew what she had done as a child, so she knew all the tricks of the trade. We had to tell her, ease up, ease up on your kids a little bit there. So people change in life. The important thing is the recovery of the lost See, all what we've been talking about with sexual ethics now can come full circle. God has great demands in our life. They may seem unendurable at times, but God makes them because he knows that he's more than enough for us. And those difficulties and deprivations in life are there to grow Jesus in us so that when we are in need, we call out to God and realize the abundance of his care and love for us and are then able to minister to those who create, we think create those difficulties in our life, including sometimes our spouses, with the love that we have experienced from God in our time of difficulty and trial. And in the context of marriage, with or without difficulty, we learn to become one in that and to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to forgive just as God has deeply forgiven us on a regular basis. Can God use a difficult marriage? Not only can he use it, that's the one he uses the most to shape Jesus in us. May the Lord bless this proclamation of his word in our hearing.